So I had, I had written down a list of questions. But, um, so I guess my first one is, um, so we met at a writers' conference, and uh, at that conference I argued that, that writers um, have a solemn responsibility to speak out about issues like climate change and environmental catastrophes, uh, and sometimes even more so than scientists do. And so I wonder what your opinion is on um, speculative fiction and what what more that can bring to the climate change conversation mm. than just science and scientists. Oh well, it's bringing a lot. Um, in my in my piece in Medium, um, Medium slash Matter, called "It's Not Climate Change, It's Everything Change," I devote quite a lot of space to to uh, speculative fiction. But in order to have an impact, it has to be accurate. So just telling us that rubber chickens are going to inherit the earth, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to work. The, the information presented has to be accurate to real life in order for it to have an impact. Otherwise, people just view it as entertainment. Right. And um, so you mentioned your Medium article. Um, and so it was the piece, I think, um, you, you wrote what I consider, I consider it to be a, very much so a seminal work for non-scientists, um, titled It's Not Climate Change, It's Everything Change. And I honestly think that that should become mandatory reading for everyone on the planet. Um, but what prompted you to write that article? Well, in 2009, I did a piece for a German newspaper called The End of Oil, because at that point, people were thinking that oil was going to come to an end. Um, now we know there's a lot more of it. In fact, there's a lot more of it than is, than is good for us, unless we can develop carbon negative technologies that actually suck CO2 out of the air. Uh, and those, those are being developed, and I put a, a list of them at the end of the climate piece. So should those be deployed on a massive enough scale, you can bring the outpouring of CO2 into the atmosphere to a standstill and possibly even reverse it. In that case, the, the oil people will be able to have their cake and eat it too. But if that is not the case, they won't be able to have their cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, People right now, and I noticed this in Norway when I was there, as you know, Norway is an oil state. They've made a lot of money out of oil. They're really pushing green technology. And a lot of people have Teslas, which are electric cars, as you know. And as soon as the Elon Musk power wall, which is a home battery that you can stick on your house charge it up from the sun and run your appliances and your car off it. As soon as that uh, was announced, it was sold out within a, within 24 hours, the first run. And, and that's just the first run. So you remember, maybe you don't, possibly you're too young, but the early cell phones were about this big and they were like a shoebox and they were very expensive. And of course, people looking at that said, who wants one of those? What do we need that for? As soon as they made them small and cheap, they're everywhere, and they are. Uh, um, they essentially disintermediated the land phone uh, business. So most people have cells; they don't have landlines anymore. And those transitions can be very, very, very quick. It took three years from the time transatlantic air travel became possible. It took three years for the international steamer business to collapse. Uh, that which had been considered eternal, it was always going to be there, that was how you crossed the Atlantic, gone like that. And we remember what happened to um, tapes with music on them as soon as CDs became available. Mm -hmm. And we also remember what happened to CDs as soon as downloading on your computer became available. Those things can just vanish like that. Mm -hmm. So if I were an oil company, I would be uh, buying into carbon negative technologies, ones that suck carbon out of the atmosphere, and I would be presenting, it has to be able to stand up to rigid scrutiny, however, I would be presenting green gas. Can you elaborate some more on green well, gas? Well, green gas would be gas produced in conjunction with a carbon uh, carbon sucking technologies, ones that take carbon out of the air. Right. So you could say that your okay, company, right. because it's taking this much out of the air and only putting that much in, is, is, uh, is on balance contributing to the elimination of carbon from the atmosphere. Right. 
You don't want to eliminate all of it, of course. That wouldn't be good either. No, We'd burst no. into flames. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> too much oxygen, that would be bad too. Uh, so it's a balance. It's a question of balance. Um, but people will grab that electrical solar technology as soon as it's available and as soon as it's cheap enough. Wouldn't you? Of course you of course, would. Yeah. <laughs> if you had an electric car that it would take you 20 minutes to recharge uh, and that you could run it off a, off a power wall in your home, of course you'd do it. You'd get off the grid as fast as you could because then you would be self-sufficient and you would be getting it direct from the sun, no moving parts. Uh, you wouldn't need a big wind turbine in your backyard or anything. Um, so you were talking earlier a little bit about balance, and I remember that in your article you wrote that uh, Barry Lord had postulated that we're on the brink of a cultural shift uh, yes. towards renewables and away from this sort of um, uh, what I have uh, phenomenon and yes, towards I am what, what I, I buy, what I can protect, and yes, what I can. Yes, I am what I save and, and yes. protect. And so I know that conceptually that can be a little hard to think about sometimes. And so well, let's what go do you back to the beginning. That's yes. what the world would look like. Oh, you mean once we did it? Okay, Barry Lord's idea is that every energy source brings with it a culture, um, certain sets of behaviors, certain products, certain artifacts, certain ways of depicting society, certain ways of arranging society that are specific to it. And uh, this guy called Ian Morris has, a, has also a book that talks about that. So hunter-gatherers, uh, more sexual equality, very little social hierarchy, um, no prisons, because no buildings. <laughs> so more interpersonal violence. You solve things by killing the other person if you could. Um, and uh, and more, uh, more, more sharing. So more, a more horizontal society. You share uh, artifacts, you share food across the group because otherwise your group doesn't succeed. Farming comes in, social hierarchy, a lot of se sexual differentiation because you need upper body strength to do the farming and you need um, lots of kids to help run the farm and do all those agricultural chores. And you produce surpluses and that enables kings and priests and warriors and soldiers, people who live off the agriculture but don't actually do it themselves. So that whole society is what we were living in until the advent of cheap energy. And first that was coal, but coal takes a lot of workers. You have to send them down into the ground, they have to dig, dig up the coal. So the culture fostered was one of labor. So labor intensive, it was good to work, it was good to have a job. And the struggles in the 19th century were about uh, appropriate pay for workers, workers' rights, that's where Marxism came from, that's when it came, um, and that was, that was putting the means of production into the hands of the workers. Mm -hmm. But what if you don't need that many workers? What then, or of that kind? Uh, electrical technology comes along. You don't need a lot of upper body strength to turn on a light switch or, or work a keyboard. So more gender equality comes in. Women can work keyboards too. Uh, there's still some squabbles about how much you should be paid for working that keyboard, but the jobs are, are there, whereas once upon a time there would have been a lot of pressure, stay at home, have kids, provide the labor for the agriculture or the people who go down into the mine, or in the case of Napoleon, um, cannon fodder. <laughs> so now he says, um, so coal was workers, oil was consumers didn't need so many workers of that kind, but you needed people to buy the things that could be so cheaply made. So big push for consumption, you saw that right after World War II, all the stuff you could buy, uh, and that's what we've been doing um, ever since in Western society, a lot of luxury goods, all of those things. Now we're on the hinge of a transition to renewables, and that will be a culture, says Barry Lord, of um, saving and protecting rather than owning, buying, consuming. It's not that we won't spend money, but we will spend money on different things. We will make money in different ways. We will spend money on different things. All right, yeah, I, that's a society that I greatly look forward to. Yes, well, there will be all kinds of uh, things that will change. We'll be eating different foods. We will be viewing agribiz in a whole different way. 
um, and pesticides and, and uh, biokillers. You know, that's going to really have to be looked at as <laughs> the negative impact could be hor horrific. Um, so we are going to be seeing more and more people going into either through volunteer labor or, or through jobs that are created by green businesses and renewables. And there's already a huge number of jobs in Canada in that sector. We just haven't been told about them because guess what? Our government doesn't like them. They've bet everything on the oil. Yeah. Uh, and you've seen what happen when, happens when oil goes down. And as more and more people want to get off the boom and bust cycle of oil and onto the no grid solution, you're going to see a drop in, in demand. Um, and a lot of those oil businesses are going to be left wagging at the end of a string um, unless they are smart enough to invest in not only renewables, but renewables that make sense and in carbon negative, um, carbon sucking technologies. So when do you think this sort of change would take place? Um, when? You know, when I, when I it's happening the now. Generations, or do you oh, think no. it's something that can happen? Oh, in remember what I said very quickly. Those things that happen very quickly. So the move from the big shoeboxes to everybody having a cell phone, how long did that take? It long. took about 15 years. Um, the move of uh, ca tape cassettes going, going the way of the dodo, how long did that take? Probably about 10 years. Um, so you, you see some things coming back, for instance, uh, vinyls coming back, vinyl records. People like the sound better, guess what? <laughs> uh, and paper books, we were told those are going, would be going away, but they're not, because people like the tactility and the deeper read that you can get neurologically from paper. Mm -hmm. So we're, we are like the rat in the maze as a, as a species. We go down them, we go down one path, it leads somewhere. We go down another path, it's a dead end. We come back, we try something else. So we are gonna have to be very inventive in the next few decades. We're gonna have to, we're gonna need all the smart people we can get thinking out of the box as much as they can. Mm -hmm. And this is where the big conversion between the arts and the sciences is gonna happen. They're going to want, guess what, um, Guess what the U.S. government did right after 9-11? Hired a bunch of Hollywood script writers <laughs> to investigate possible scenarios. So possible scenarios, there's going to be a lot of young people thinking about possible scenarios using uh, technologies and beginning technologies that are already there. It might be a lot of fun to, to do a contest, build the ideal stewardship city. That would be a good contest. That would be. Um, so you mentioned earlier an article that you wrote for that German newspaper back in Yes, Die Zeit, right? yes. yes. Um, and and I, I have a quote from that article. You said, are we capable of thinking about longer term issues or like the lobster in a pot full of water that's being brought slowly to the boil? Will we fail to realize the danger that we're in until it's too late? Yes. Is it? No, it's not too late. And yes, we're realizing the danger, but we're a bit behind. <laughs> it would have been nice to realize the danger back in 1972 yes. when the Club of Rome wrote its report saying, if we don't do this, this, and this, and this, the result will be that. And they were right about most of those things. So I think the time for climate change deniers is over. We're now in the time with governments like ours of, of not, not outright denial, but a kind of Let's pretend it's not really it's happening. We know it. it's not. We know it's happening, but let's pretend it's not. So we're in the age of double thinking like that. And one of the examples I gave in my piece was this stupid map that they did, in which they took, in which they said that that there wasn't a problem with Arctic ice because they averaged it over 30 years. Okay, so it's in the last 10 that it's all been melting like crazy. So they want, they want to lull people so they can keep doing as they're doing because all of their business models are built on that. Um, it's, up for a, it's up to a smart person like you, good with numbers, to figure out what happens to our tax dollars. So we're massively subsidizing oil. What do we get back out of that? 
So some of the people I've asked say it's a net loss of about between eight and nine hundred bucks per Canadian per year. We're losing money by subsidizing oil so heavily. But does that take into account the jobs in oil, the people in which also pay taxes? I don't know. Hmm. That would be something that's that yeah. to look at. And get at it, get at it with the pencil, Maya. <laughs> tell, tell me what you find out. I shouldn't say pencil, I should calculator. Yes. Um, one of the interesting things that we did at the astrophysics program, there was just a, after we were done the, the bulk of the curriculum, some of the lecturers would lecture on things that they were just generally interested in. Um, and one of our lecturers had made a, a very much so a rudimentary model um, that projected in the next hundred years, if we continued to burn fossil fuels at the rate we were burning them, um, you know, continued, um, for example, solar panel production at the rate that we're producing them, and, and various other quantities, um, what percentage of our population would be left? Right. And uh, it was interesting because we got to play around with this model after mm -hmm. the lecture. And in almost all scenarios, I would say 99% of scenarios, we had a negative population in the next hundred years. You mean we all die? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> um, now, it was quite rudimentary, but people yeah. are working on these sorts of things. And it's yes. very interesting to look at how... Yeah, well, what we need is a new solar technology that doesn't use a lot of toxins yes. and poisons. Yes, that was the Rare main Earth. problem. Yeah, big problem. It was, it was interesting but because as we continued to, one thing that we noticed was that we couldn't continue to scale up uh, solar technologies just because of how toxic the chemicals are. Exactly. Are. Yeah, so the next thing for, people, for materials engineers to examine is how do you make a solar panel without using those things? Yes. Yeah. Um, or so how do, well, let's even revise that. How do you capture solar energy? It doesn't have to be a panel. Mm -hmm. How do you capture solar energy? So your writing has sometimes been described as environmentally aware fiction. Um, can you elaborate on that? What got you interested in writing on this? Topic? Oh, well, I grew up with all of this. My dad was a biologist. So we used to sit around the dining room table in the 50s and discuss the negative impact of burping cows. <laughs> of course, as a teenager, I wasn't that interested in it at that time. <laughs> uh, but that's what went on at our house. And, you, you know, if you're if you have a biological grounding, you know a few things. Number one, again, we're very dependent on our available food supply, and uh, toxic environments negatively affect us in any biological form. I don't know why they're, they're allowing neurotoxins anywhere near young babies or pregnant mothers. They're neurotoxins, for heaven's sakes. Um, oh, I was wrong, we're getting a little sprinkle. I don't think it's gonna rain a lot. I think all that was forecasted was a very light rain, if yeah. anything. So. No, this is just a little bit of this and that. Uh, and um, say, what was the other thing? Oh yes, what, why am I? Why do I know about this stuff? I, I, I seem always to have known about it. Um, so I follow it along. Mm -hmm. Right. So you make the point in one of your articles that in the last 40 years, 52 percent of uh, the animal population on our Earth has disappeared. So, do you think we're in the midst of an extinction? Well, you probably have probably come to your attention the title of this book called The Sixth Extinction. Yes. Uh, we are in the, in the midst of quite a lot of things going extinct. Whether it will be a mega wipeout of everything, that remains to be seen. Um, if the oceans die, we're, we're in deep trouble. We but are. we will be wheezing long before we reach the point of absolute ocean death. We'll be having a lot of trouble breathing. Yes. Um, and so this documentary, it's... Oh, no. Um, it's all this right. Documentary I don't mind is, getting wet. ...is uh, geared going. towards young people and mobilizing yes. young people to act on climate yeah. change. Well, so the funnest thing for them to do would be to build a, a stewardship town. You know, using the... Give them a list of available technologies and ask them how they would arrange their town. Mm. Um, do you know Do you know the work um, that's being done in Bristol, England? Uh, not specifically. Okay, no. it has the goal of being a, a green community, so that they've got a lot of stuff going there. You should look at Bristol, England, green, and see see what suggestion. Yeah, I believe I recall seeing a news report about Bristol, maybe seven, eight years ago. Yeah, perhaps. yeah. Look, I, I look up Bristol. See what they're doing. Solar panels on roofs yeah, everywhere. And there, and there are. Um, um, there are various communities that are trying to get themselves 
off the grid, you know, be sort of zero, zero uh, or neutral. But as you say, the toxicity of materials used in present day solar panels is a, is a problem. And I'm not at all keen on big wind turbine parks, parks partic big wind turbine farms, especially in national and provincial parks. I think that's a really terrible idea. They kill a lot of raptors and bats. So we were talking about young people. And, yeah. And so because this documentary is geared towards young people, yes. what would be your message to them in regards to climate change and taking action on climate change? You can do it. In fact, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let us hope that um, governments and older people see the, see the plus in uh, investing in young people, and in particularly in young people's education, mm -hmm. and in the motivation of young people, because that's who is going to have to do this. What do you think is the most important step that young people can take uh, in combating you climate change? You mean every and each one? Well, How do you young? think it would be political action, or you know, action like turning off your, your lights when you're not in the room? Oh, I think you can do both. Uh, there's a lot of online petition sites that aren't hard to sign. Mind you, if our government decides that we're all political enemies if we sign them, the jails are going to be quite full, aren't they? <laughs> uh, however, let us hope it will not come to that. Yes. I think that the, uh, all of the parties except the incumbent government know this is a prob problem. I think this government knows it's a problem too, but they just don't want to talk about it. So, um, political and personal action. Political and personal. But as, I, as I've said, if it's too expensive, if it takes up too, too much of people's time, or if things get too depressing, uh, those are all demotivators. So uh, take action that you know you can actually do without killing yourself, etc. So something, with, something that's within your scope and uh, know that you're not alone. <laughs> I think those are the good, the good things. I think that's an important message with young people you're not alone absolutely not alone in fact they turned out in massive numbers for the 350.org climate march yes yeah. yes and 350.org has been a great mobilizer of young people um and so in one of your articles you wrote about a carbonivore fund that, that yes. funds companies that well it doesn't exist outside. yet it's an idea ah, but okay. the guy curating it made this list of um He's added some more to it since. So I think he's got about 15 mm -hmm. new technologies that take carbon out of the atmosphere. So more than is being put in. And if those were deployed, then at least the CO2 part of the problem could be solved. And some of them are multi-purpose. For instance, uh, one of the cheapest, fastest ways of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere is to regrow degenerated tropical forests, of which there are now a lot. And one of the companies, Permian Global, uh, that's exactly what it's geared to do. So I think there's a, a couple of them doing that. Others are technologies, for instance, that, um, that grow algae, and the algae sucks, sucks the carbon out of the atmosphere, releases oxygen, and then you can turn the algae into oil. So out of the ground is not the only place that oil needs to come from. Uh, it would be much better to think of oil as a cycle rather than a linear process with the first stop being in the ground and last stop being burnt releasing CO2. If you could see it as a circle, CO2 is sucked out of the atmosphere, it's turned into product X, Product X is turned into oil. Oil makes CO2, which is sucked out of the atmosphere, made into, so all of those things can happen. I think some of the earlier solutions weren't so happy. They used a lot of agricultural land to, to grow biofuels, and then really they weren't, they weren't uh, growing fuel. Yeah. Uh, but some of the later ones, and again, took the sewing machine 80 years to become commercialized. I'm not sure that we have 80 years, but these things can de be de developed very rapidly if the will is there. So, what do you think about the action that 
or lack of action that our government has been taking on climate change. Well, they've been joined. My, the, my dad tells me a little bit about um, how, you know, in past Canadians uh, were some of the most admired people in exactly. the world. And now we've been... We've we're been we're the pariahs. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pariahs we've been very, climate. very bad. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that has to stop. And it comes from a short-sighted <laughs> devotion to oil. They're very short-sighted and very narrow. And of course, when you have when you have people who are convinced that they're right and they're not listening to other people, it's just as annoying in a government as it is when it's your roommate. You know, what we all want is a conversation in which we are included and our points of view are taken into consideration. We don't want somebody hogging all the cake in the fridge uh, and then telling us that, that we can't have any and not only that, they're not, they're not going to discuss it with us. So <laughs> that can be very annoying. And that's why this government is so unpopular. So what do you think that our government needs to do in order to correct its image on the global scene? And what do you think that the average Canadian can do in order to um, create that change? Well, if the image is connected with, with a really rotten um, record on, on climate change legislation, there's not much you can do about that except to vote differently. Um, but you can put your energy into um, positive actions. That's not going to get your government any credits, but it might get Canada as a whole some credits. I mean, poor Americans, I've, I've known them over the year, many, many years, and uh, they had a period of time when they were going around saying, you know, forgive us for our government. We didn't vote for them. It wasn't us. We don't agree with them. And he said, calm down. We know it wasn't you. <laughs> Um, and so just to, to wrap things up, what do you think the average person should do in order to combat climate change? Well, which average person? Because there's, there's a big range of average people. How, yes, how old the is average, this average, the average person? Young person. Uh, how, how young? Oh my. Um, Can they vote yet? Let's say no. No, they can't vote. Um, the average young person. I would the first thing I would do is take a look at what they're actually doing. That can give you a big clue. So what are they doing now? Uh, how much trouble are their schools going to be in if, if they encourage uh, carbon positive action, for instance, or, or planet positive action? A lot of the religions are now going to the stewardship side. You saw that with the Pope. Uh, you can see it in groups like Arasha, a green, um, a green religious organization on the on the west coast in Canada, but it's actual, actually global. So these things exist. You can uh, participate through organizations like that or through 350.org. You don't have to be able to vote to keep an eye on it. Because young people are computer literate, they can find and follow such things on their computers. Uh, Avaz, the big petition signing uh, organization, has had a number of petitions about climate change that have had, you know, really large numbers of, of people signing them, and they can influence governments. So, what do you think is the most uh, powerful indicator of climate change that you've come across in your research? The California drought, the uh, measurable decrease in Arctic ice. You can see it if you go there, where it was five years ago, where it is now. It's quite frightening. So those are the two that are, that are really obvious. But as temperatures warm, of course, there's more evaporation. What goes up has to come down, and you're seeing these massive deluges. There have been massive deluges in the past. Uh, but there seem to be a lot more of them now. And people saying, are saying, you're not seeing more tropical storms, but the ones that do build are a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. So they're a lot more destructive. All right. Well, that it has exhausted plus, my list of questions. Plus invasive species. Right, yes. So those aren't any fun. No fun. <laughs> That's true. Um, so those are all the questions that I had for well, you. Well, good for you. That's um, a good list of questions. <laughs> you can now cut it all up and make it into something presentable. I'm sure it's presentable as is, but I will do that. <laughs> okay, you can get the part where it rains on it. See, <laughs> climate change. It rained <laughs> on us.